The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. My disclosures aren't relevant to uh, the talk today. I do some consulting work for a company that makes transvenous diaphragmatic faces. Uh, currently, my research is supported by the American Heart Association and the NIH. I'm going to talk about any off-label or investigational use of drugs. So today, using the case-based approach, we'll talk about um, the pillars of lung protective ventilation and their limitations as currently applied in most patients. Uh, discuss the concepts of plateau pressure, driving pressure, and transpulmonary pressure, and then talk about how these concepts are relevant to the induction, mechanical ventilation management, and extubation of patients with truly marginal cardiac function. Spend some time talking about the consequences of inappropriate mechanical ventilation of the right heart, and um, perhaps pushing back a little bit against uh, commonly accepted wisdom particularly where it uh, impacts on the role of positive end expiratory pressure on cardiac function and end with proposing approach to managing ventilators in patients who have both significant lung injury and really impaired cardiac function. Um, and when I talk about impaired cardiac function, the last five years of my clinical practice have been spent in the CCU and the CTICU. So my definition of impaired cardiac function has changed somewhat. I, I no longer think of 30% EFs as bad. I'm, we get impressed with EFs in the single digits. Uh, and we see a bunch of those patients. And, you know, COVID has taught us that about 40% of patients with COVID have some degree of um, RV dysfunction. Having said that, I don't know exactly what proportion of patients with ARDS have significant cardiac dysfunction. We know that in the universe of patients with ARDS, um, a subset will have ARDS-induced cardiac dysfunction. Now, if you follow the definitions of uh, Via Baron and the, the group in France, it, that can be as high as 20 to 25 percent, although I think that's a little too sensitive. Um, and then you have a subset of patients that have pre-existing cardiac dysfunction that also uh, develop ARDS. And that's sort of the population that we see most frequently, right? We don't uh, have the opportunity to take care of plain ARDS a whole lot in our units. A small observational study from 2015 found that about a third of patients, about 38% of patients with sepsis and ARDS also had cardiac dysfunction. Um, however, they define cardiac dysfunction typically with an EF less than 50%. So the, the number is substantial. Just how substantial it is, I actually don't know. Our principal weapon in treating patients with ARDS is lung protective ventilation. And this is perhaps the major, uh, I hesitate to say the only, because there have been lots of success stories in ICU care over the last two decades, but really this is the signal achievement of critical care research in the last two decades or so, right? And as you all know, uh, it rests on three legs. The um, low tidal volume bit, which is defined as four to eight mils per kilo, um, not limited to six per se, but it has allowed some uh, elasticity in that uh, tidal volume. A plateau pressure of less than 30 centimeters of water and appropriate peak. Now, what appropriate PEEP is, is something I'm going to come back to because my argument is going to be that we don't really use appropriate PEEP in a lot of patients, and it hurts a small subset of our patients, and that's the subset I'm talking about. And, you know, you all know this graph. This is from the original OddsNet study uh, that shows a dramatic uh, improvement in outcomes, and this has been our standard of care ever since. So to get you thinking about uh, lung protective ventilation, I'm gonna present two clinical patients and I'm gonna just put them up here as questions for you to think about. Um, and I'll get to their clinical data in a, in a short time. So our first patient is a 54 year old lady. She's had a combined heart kidney transplant and unfortunately developed acute right ventricular failure. Her she's being ventilated with 
tidal volumes of six mil per kilo ideal body weight, which for her was about 300, a respiratory rate of 30, a PEEP of five, and a plateau pressure of 24 centimeters of water. Um, as, you know, to paraphrase Nate Silver in his podcast, good use of polling or bad use of polling? Is this appropriate lung protective ventilation or not? Second patient, 48 year old lady transferred from an outside hospital to us, BMI of 44, severe hypoxemic respiratory failure and severe Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy um, with biventricular dysfunction. She's being ventilated with six mils per kilo ideal body weight, which for her is 320 cc's, respiratory rate of 20, PEEP of 20, plateau pressure of 32. Lung protective or not? So we'll take a step back and talk about the pressures we think about when we talk about ventilation, right? Plateau pressures, driving pressures, and transpulmonary pressures. So, and this is, you know, uh, basic stuff for most of you. The, the plateau pressure is, by definition, it's the pressure that we think the alveoli see at the, during mechanical ventilation. So to try to estimate that, we put an inspiratory pause um, and here you see the peak inspiratory pressure. The um, pause allows the pressure to equilibrate until ideally flow has ended. So there's no flow across the lungs and you get your plateau pressure, right? And in a, in a real ventilator screen, uh, for example, the ventilators that we have, this is how you, the plateau pressure looks. The oscillations that you see here are cardiac oscillations. The driving pressure, which has always been a thing, but has really come into prominence since 2015 and Amato's uh, sort of landmark New England Journal paper, uh, the, the driving pressure is the difference between the plateau pressure and the peak. The transpulmonary pressure is sort of one step uh, further in, in, in subtlety, if you will, and that is the difference between the airway pressure and the pleural pressure. So that's the distending pressure at the level of the alveolus. All right, so what are the problems with plateau pressure? Uh, one of my uh, teachers at MGH, who uh, some of you will know, Bill Kimball, once told me uh, fixed numbers indicate fixed lines, right? And the plateau pressure is a fixed number, right? It is 30 centimeters of water. That's our uh, definition of a safe plateau pressure. And if you believe everything you read, as long as your plateau pressures are less than 30 centimeters, you're fine, you're, you're safe, your patient is safe. So think about a couple of scenarios, right? A patient who's undergoing laparoscopic surgery in the OR, um, if you happen to be doing one of those robotic prostatectomies and they're standing on their heads uh, and they're, they have a new peritoneum per, for about nine hours, that's, that's how long they used to take when I was, uh, a resident, the plateau pressure is, might be something like 38 centimeters. Is that bad for the lungs, right? A patient with a BMI of 54 and a plateau pressure of 35, or a patient with a BMI of 20 and a plateau pressure of 24. Are these all self-evidently good or bad for the patient? I would argue we don't know. They may be reasonable or they may not because what we care about is the stress and strain at the level of the respiratory unit of the alveolus. And the plateau pressure is too blunt an instrument to give us information about that. And the problems are that it relies on at least three things. It relies on lung compliance, it relies on pleural pressure and abdominal pressure, and it relies on PEEP. So we, and we generally, we don't know. We know the PEEP. If we want, we can calculate the lung compliance. Um, our ventilators will often give it. And, but what we don't know is we don't know the pleural pressure. We don't know the abdominal pressure. And that's where we, we get into trouble, right? The driving pressure is um, nicer, in my opinion, because uh, it's, it takes the pleural pressure equal, uh, a little bit out of the equation because the pleural pressure, abdominal pressure affects the plateau and the peak both equally, right? Now, I would sort of hasten to add that the concept of driving pressure-based ventilation is a hypothesis, right? That was strongly suggested by Amatha's 
and his group's reanalysis of all the OddsNet trials, um, 3,000 odd patients, um, there hasn't yet been a trial comparing low tidal volume ventilation, conventional ventilation, head to head with driving pressure targeted ventilation. Although um, Amato and his group are planning that. The transboundary pressure is even more um, difficult to standardize, but, um, and I will argue and I'll, I'll show that we can actually estimate the transboundary pressure in a number of clinical settings, even without the esophageal balloon and you know, the more sophisticated tools of respiratory monitoring. So imagine that you uh, are called to intubate a patient in an ICU. Now, I don't know how um, emergency airways work at Vanderbilt. Uh, those of you from MGH here will know that uh, we, the SICU, the surgical ICU, intubates patients across the hospital, including the MICU. In the heart center ICU, when there's an anesthesiologist on service, we do our own intubations. Otherwise, we call RICU. That's our surgical ICU intubating team. Um, so my point is that, you know, anesthesiologists and ICU trainees and attendings get to intubate all sorts of sick patients on an emergent basis. So patients with ARDS have pulmonary hypertension. We've known that at least since 1977, when my former boss, actually my current boss, he's still, I still work in his lab, um, Warren Zapel showed in 1977 that acute respiratory failure causes pulmonary hypertension. Now, we know that this is true even in the era of lung protective ventilation. In this paper from Bull and uh, colleagues in the Blue Journal, they showed that the transpulmonary gradient, which is the, as you know, the mean PA pressure minus the wedge, the transpulmonary gradient is a marker of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And they showed that it is A, elevated in a lot of patients with ARDS and is associated with poor outcomes. Yesterday, I mentioned that you know, we may actually have more sophisticated measures than the pulmonary vascular resistance, uh, like the pulmonary compliance, to think of outcomes in both ARDS and heart failure. But there is no doubt that a substantial number of patients with ARDS, even in this era of lung protective ventilation, will have pulmonary hypertension. And a subset of those patients will have what has been described as acute core pulmonale, which uh, uh, Francois Jardine's group defined as RV dilatation plus septal dyskinesia. And this uh, figures from their original paper describing the concept in 1997. Uh, what you're seeing is an M mode echo at the LV, um, at the parasomal long axis level and pressure tracings. And what they're showing is that in uh, the presence of acute core pulmonale, a septal dyskinesia, so this is the interventricular septum, and you see that during diasleep, under normal circumstances, the septum uh, is, is relaxed, right? This is the contraction of the LV posterior lateral wall and the septum, and this is relaxation. But in acute carpal mail, the septum actually becomes dys dyskinetic. And the reason for that is right ventricular contraction takes longer than left ventricular contraction. And um, as the RV faces increase afterload, what happens is that the duration of RV contraction sort of outlasts LV contraction. And you can see this in the pressure tracings here. So the transeptal gradient shifts and the septum starts to flatten out, right? So this is what causes uh, septal dyskinesia. Now, severe acute carpal tunnel, where the RV is dilated enough that it's as big as the LV, has been observed in about 8% of patients with ARDS and is the only subset of um, acute carpal tunnel that's associated routinely in the data from this group, and they published a lot on this with higher mortality, which suggests that the concept of acute carpal pulmonale per se is a sensitive indicator of RV dysfunction, but not RV failure, right? Uh, one of the reasons is that RV failure or any ventricular failure implies poor output in the presence of adequate to high filling pressures. And this definition in general does not pay too much attention to filling pressures. So I showed this yesterday. There are going to be two or three slides that overlap with what I talked about yesterday and today. Uh, this is a patient who is post-op day three, I think, after um, uneventful cabbage. He had an arrest on the floor, was resuscitated pretty quickly, and um, came to our ICU. He was awake. He was talking. He had a low. Um, his pressures were soft, about 80, 80s over 60s. 
And I put, put an echo probe on him and I saw this. So for those of you who are not very familiar with echoes, and this is not you know, the best quality image, this is a parasonal short axis view. This is the left ventricle, that's the right ventricle. You can, you can almost never see the full RV in a parasonal short axis. But the key point is that this interventricular septum here is flattened throughout systole and diastole. So what you're seeing here is a patient with um, acute RV pressure overload who's hypotensive. Right. And this is a phenotype that you will see. Uh, this patient did not have ARDS, but this is a phenotype that you will see in a subset of patients with ARDS. You will see this in patients with end-stage interstitial lung disease that the MICU has been trying to avoid intubating forever, uh, but now they don't have a choice. The backside of the wall, and maybe they're being considered for transplant, so they're getting it intubated. And this group of patients may be one of the most vulnerable patient populations at the time of induction and intubation. So the question is, in this situation, what do you do first to stabilize the patient? Do you increase preload? The RV is supposed to be preload, you know, friendly, preload sensitive, uh, response to preload, in other words. So are you going to give a bunch of fluid? Are you going to decrease preload to try to get the ventricle on the prop, the non-descending limb of the Starling curve? By the way, I, I believe that there is no descending limb on the Starling curve. Uh, that that was a misinterpretation of the original data. Uh, increase contractility using a me medication like milvanone, um, increase systemic pressure, that is the blood pressure with norepinephrine, increase pulmonary decrease pulmonary vascular resistance with inhaled nitric oxide or call for ECMO. And yesterday I spent a lot of time discussing our physiology, so I'm not going to do that now, except to say that it's really important for um, uh, clinicians, when they're dealing with a vulnerable right ventricle, to ensure that the systemic pressures are as high as possible. Because it turns out that the function of the RV is very, very strongly de dependent on how hard the left ventricle is working. And there are a number of ways that increase left ventricle work. And the, the easiest way we have to make the left ventricle work hard is by making it do pressure work, so increasing the systemic pressure. So increasing the systemic pressure uh, improves blood flow through the RCA, maintains septal geometry, and the septum is a huge contributor to RV function. And um, by ventricular interdependence, transfers some of the work the LV does to help the RV. So the one thing to remember if you're having to intubate some, um, someone like this with a weak RV, you know, a lot of people will say, you should not avoid intubating patients, avoid positive pressure in patients with poor RVs. And that's extremely sound advice until you actually don't have a choice. And then you have to do it safely, as safely as you can. And one of the ways to do it safely is to ensure that before you do ionotropy, before you do nitric oxide, certainly before you do fluid, you make sure that there is generous systemic blood pressure room and that your LV is working as hard as the patient's heart will allow. And this is uh, from a 2016 European Journal of Heart Failure review by the European Society of Cardiology on uh, acute RV dysfunction in the ICU. And you know, it, this, this article is a very nice article, but I would argue that it, it doesn't necessarily talk about what we need to do in the order that we need to do it when we are facing an unstable patient. So the first thing you need to do is maintain blood pressure. Once you have pressure room, you can consider whether an ionotrope is indicated. Um, if you're in Europe, you would consider levosimandin. We've never had it in the US, so um, too bad for us. I don't know if it matters a big deal anyway. Um, if you have access to uh, inhaled pulmonary vasodilators, nitric oxide, uh, valetri, procycline, it's possible to use it. Nine times out of 10, you will end up taking volume off, not giving volume, with the exception of a subset of patients with acute RV MIs. It turns out most patients with RV dysfunction, because they're facing an increased offload, are not very fluid responsive. And actually giving fluids is, fluids is one of the worst things you can do to them. And one way to exclude that very quickly is by echo. You don't need to waste time trying to get invasive hemodynamics. Uh, but nowadays echo is available you know, across a hospital. Almost anybody can get a point of care ultrasound. And it's a very good way to uh, assess whether or not this patient will need more fluid. And then being a cardiology review, they don't talk about mechanical ventilation management at all. 
right? And that's, that's what I'm going to spend some of this talk discussing. So now you've intubated the patient, you need to ventilate them. And um, as I said before, uh, conventional wisdom very appropriately uh, suggests that you don't want to ventilate somebody with a bad, bad right heart. And we know that we don't want our patients to become hypoxemic, hypocathic, or acidemic because all of these powerful pulmonary vasoconstrictors, and we're going to increase um, RV offload and, and our patients are not going to do well. That's absolutely true, absolutely uncontroversial, and I'm not going to talk about that again. What I am going to talk about is this concept of inappropriate PEEP. Because if you remember back when I talked about lung protective ventilation, appropriate PEEP was third leg of the lung protective ventilation stool, if you will. But appropriate PEEP has become defined now by the ARDSnet table, right? Uh, generally the low PEEP table of the ARDSnet which explicitly ties PEEP to the FiO2, right? So you have the FiO2 requirement from whatever 0.3 to one, and your PEEP goes from five to 18 or 20. And I think that is A, unfortunate, B, unphysiological, and C, responsible for at least some harm. So let's go back to the first patient I talked about in, in the two questions. So the 54 year old lady who had, her, who had a heart kidney transplant. This lady, unfortunately, immediately after uh, transplant, turned out her pulmonary vascular resistance was not very well estimated pre-op, and she did have substantial pulmonary arterial hypertension, and so her RV failed very acutely. So this was not a rejection, not an early rejection. This was just um, offload mismatch. Within 12 hours and post-op day one, she had a right-sided impeller placement. For those of you who are familiar with temporary mechanical support devices. The impeller is this 21 French sheath requiring femoral venous line placed um, centrifugal, uh, sorry, axial pump that pushes blood from the RA into the PA, right? Um, it's a very nice thing conceptually. Our experience with the RP impeller has been dismal and we now use a different system. However, she was placed in the RV, um, right side in Bella. She was very hypoxemic, had a P2F ratio of 80. Uh, she was on 100%, had a mixed venous of 50, which gave her a FIC index of 1.8. She was on boatloads of presses and inotropes. She was on uh, 10 of epi, 7.5 mics per kilo of diputamine, and Levo 20. And I should mention again, I don't know how Vanderbilt does their presses, but we... Uh, I think somewhat suboptimally at MGH, we do our Levo and Epi and Phenylephrine just by absolute numbers. So 10 of Epi is 10 mics per minute, not 10 mics per kilo per minute, thankfully. Uh, Levo is also 20 mics per minute. That matters a little bit because, you know, Levo of 20 and somebody with a BMI of 70 is not quite the same of um, a Levo of 20 and someone like her who had a BMI in the high teens, low 20s. Right. Her maps are in the 60s and all of this, her CVP is 22. She's got severe tricuspid regurgitation. Her peer pressures are high. She's on nitric oxide. She's paralyzed sedated on the settings um, that are, you know, 60 cc's per kilo, rate of 30, F out of 100%, peep of five. Why peep of five? Well, she has a really bad RP. Right. So this um, is a set of her echoes. This is the parasomal uh, long axis. You can see the RVOT looking really dilated here. You know, a general rule of thumb is the RVOT, the uh, ascending aorta and the left atrium are roughly the same size. Here you can see that the RVOT predominates. This is the RV inflow view. You can see the anterior and posterior leaflets, the tricuspid valve, the eustachian valve, the right atrium, the right ventricle. You can see torrential tricuspid regurgitation from this view. And then you can see on the April 4, it's not a great view because she's intubated, ventilated. Um, you can see that the RV looks, it's not definitive because the margins aren't super clear, but it looks like it's actually more dilated than the left ventricle, right? So this is a lady with a really bad RV right now. Uh, this is her x-ray. So you can, I don't know how well you can see the impeller. The impeller is coming down from the IVC. It's sort of curving through the RA and going into the pulmonary artery. Oops. You can see our PA catheter here. Um, and her lung peels don't look great, right? There's a fair amount of infiltrates there. 
So she was slated to go for VA ECMO. We, I decided I happened to be on that day. I decided to try to see if we could optimize her PEEP. And uh, this graph is from our, taken from our EPIC data. Um, so at the time we did the recruitment, it was around between 10 and 11, her maps were in the 70s, her peer pressures were, mean peer pressures were high 50s, and her CVP was close to 25, right? And um, post-recruitment in Best Peep, her map actually improved, her CVP dropped substantially. And the key to this patient is that she's one of the relatively rare patients that have a guaranteed um, source of right-sided flow with the impeller. But the impeller, like most ventricular assist devices, is very offload sensitive. And therefore, it uh, doesn't do well or doesn't perform as well when it's facing a relatively high afterload. What happened to Lebo was Lebo went from 20 to 5 within a few hours of recruitment. And her P2F ratio improved. And her um, mixed penis went from 50 something percent to more than 70 percent. Her driving pressure, so she hope was five. And this was a lady whose uh, plateau was 24. Although the plateau of 24 is perfectly within uh, lung projective ventilation parameters, her driving pressure was 19, right? So from uh, 24 minus five. The driving, and we went to a peep of 12. This wasn't even, you know, some of the peeps I'm going to show you later in the 20s. This was, she was a small lady. So we went from a peep of five to a peep of 12, and her driving pressure dropped. To me, so that, that indicates two things. One is that now her lungs are much more compliant than they used to be. And two, her pulmonary vascular resistance has dropped. And given that she has a source of continuous flow in her uh, right, right heart with the impeller, now the impeller is able to perfuse her systemically much more adequately. Right? So the corollary to this is that if your driving pressure is high, a plateau pressure of less than 30 centimeters may not be good enough. And Amato's data from the reanalysis from his uh, New England Journal paper suggested the same thing. My point is that an optimal uh, compliance and optimal driving pressure may actually reduce the afterload to the right ventricle and help the RV flow better, right? Um, and that's why sticking to low peeps because the patient's RV has a bad RV may not be ideal. Um, I was asked to put your CME code in here. Um, so I'll leave it on for a second for you guys to uh, prove that you attended. All right, so second patient, right? So this is our um, bigger lady. She's, she was transferred to us from an outside hospital. She's 48 years old doesn't have a huge medical history, um, has a history of Prince metal angina and hypertension. She is obese, has a BMI of 44. She had a P, uh, PEA arrest at the outside hospital, got CPR for about eight minutes, um, and then was transferred to us for severe hypoxemia and LV dysfunction, uh, potentially for consideration of ECMO or other support. We generally do not do peripheral ECMO in patients with significant sepsis and uh, large BMIs. It's a difficult combination to manage, but we brought her over because the outside hospital, you know, was at the limit of what they could do. So she was sent to us on, uh, she was intubated, sedated, FP of 15 mics per minute, leave of 10, and if I had to have 100 peep of 15, uh, she had a high fever, uh, she also had PEs, she had subsegmental PEs, and she had severe consolidation. So this is a scout uh, CT um, film, and then you, you, you can sort of get a sense of her abdominal obesity. Uh, this is her chest x-ray, and this is, is one of the CT scan sections from her PE CT. This was during the time about two, two and a half years back when vaping induced lung injury was you know pretty prevalent and i remember one of my colleagues came uh came up to the icu he happened to see the ct and he got all excited he thought uh she had vaping induced lung injury uh she didn't she just she had a pneumonia but she, her lungs were horrendous like this is true ards 
right? This is what her heart looked like. This is our echo at the bedside. And uh, you can see that the left ventricle is barely moving. The RV is not dilated, and but the uh, tricuspid annulus, so if you were to do a TAPSI on her, um, so the tricuspid annulus uh, systolic excursion is a reasonably good way in a, in a patient like her to estimate RV function. You can see that the tricuspid annulus is not uh, moving much. So she has BIV dysfunction, profound left ventricular dysfunction, and severe hypoxemia. So this is ARDS. We call it a stress cardiomyopathy. She had uh, global STT changes with no region. So, or sorry, she had she didn't have global STT changes to explain something like this. And um, we decided not to cath her because she was too unstable to take to the cath lab. We, we were reasonably sure that this was a stress study map. Uh, PUF ratio was 69. She's on a fair amount of presses and has her estimated EF as 14%. Not only does she have impaired RV function, she also has documented PEs. So she has reason to have uh, issues with um, offload. She's on six mils per kilo, respiratory of 22. She actually came in on a PEEP of 15, which is great because, you know, she's a big lady, so she needs PEEP. But even to me, if it was possible, this was not enough. And one of the reasons was that her driving pressure was on the highest side. So what's your next step? Like I said, she's if she had, if she had a BMI of 30 instead of 44, we probably would have considered her for ECMO because her lactate was high. She'd just come to us. It wasn't, and she'd spent about 24 hours at the outside hospital with steadily increasing presses. Uh, but because of her habitus, because of the fact that sepsis seemed to be a big part of her, um, her driving driving the clinical picture, we were not very excited about doing ECMO. So we did. Uh, a recruitment in BESP. And this is from our um, EPIC data. You can see she moved from the outside hospital to our CCU. She was, up, she was on 100%. And we went from a PEEP of 15 to a PEEP of 20 after recruitment and BESP. And I'll talk about rec the recruitment part in a bit. In the next, whatever, 12 hours, her FIO2 went from 100% to 50%. Her pressure requirement came down. Her driving pressures substantially improved from 15 to 12, keeping in mind that we went up on her peak by five, right? And so the corollary here is that a plateau uh, pressure of greater than 30 centimeters is fine if the driving pressure is low. How low? As low as you can get it. Uh, Amato's data suggests that in ARDS, the inflection point is around 14 to 15. Uh, that mortality goes up after that. But there is like CVP almost, there's almost nothing, uh, there's no such thing as driving pressure that's too low. So this is her um, heart three days later. Right? So they almost look like different people. That is a formal echo, but uh, she had remarkable uh, ventricular recovery. And you can, you can see what her RV looks like, particularly in comparison to the pre, um, to her presentation echo. And this is a CT scan compared. This was the CT scan at admission, and this was the CT scan uh, about a week out. Now, there, there are data that show CT scans that look like this immediately after recruitment best beat. We didn't do that. She was too unstable. We don't do that at, in the US in general. We don't use CT scans as much as a research tool. Um, but th so this was a week out, but she had very good resolution of her um, pneumonia and ARDS. So the point of these two uh, cases to me is that we should not be hesitant to optimize lung mechanics, not oxygenation, but to optimize lung mechanics in patients with poor cardiac function. I'm going to talk about some of the background a little more in detail, but <clears throat> there's actually some data that this, this strategy broadly is called the open lung strategy. And um, that's and the reason it's called open lung strategy is that the idea is you keep the lung open. You don't, you prevent tidal derecruitment and analectasis throughout the respiratory cycle. So this is again from Amato. This is in a cardiac surgical ICU. They compared sort of traditional ventilator management to recruitment best PEEP. And they looked at post-operative pulmonary complications, a composite outcome, because as you know, cardiac surgery is not an incredibly high mortality, thankfully, uh, field. So they looked at post-operative respiratory complications, but 
what they found was that there's a substantial improvement in the respiratory complications that we care about, right? Uh, pneumonias, uh, need for BiPAP after extubation, reintubation or prolonged intubation and death. Combining these uh, three sort of severe uh, post-operative pulmonary uh, morbidities, they found that there was, a, there was an improvement. 7% of these patients had dysfunctional RVs uh, at baseline. So in, in either group. So it's not a great clinical test of the fact that patients with bad RVs can tolerate this approach, but it suggests that it's, it's doable. Um, we've done with Lorenzo, one of my colleagues, whom some of you will know, uh, he's been looking at ventilating obese patients for many years. And since about 2015, I've been working with him, uh, looking at uh, cardiac function, particularly right heart function. And we looked at, while he was doing his peak titration studies, we looked at um, what the patient's uh, hearts were doing with point of care ultrasound during the phase of peep titration. So we took, we had about 17 morbidly obese patients um, that we measured RV systolic function using TAPSI or S prime um, during baseline. So before we started to recruit and best peep them during recruitment and after best peep, right? Uh, peep was set using, and I, I can talk about the protocol in a little more detail, but basically you paralyze the patient, you use a pressure control strategy uh, to gradually increase, um, to recruit the lungs. Then you do a decremental peep and define the best peep by compliance, uh, the lowest driving pressure. And this is under volume control settings. And then you re-recruit uh, because as you're doing a decremental peep, you're losing recruitment. And then you go back straight to your best peep. At peak recruitment, so for us, peak recruitment is about 45 to 50 centimeters of total plateau pressure. That's 35 centimeters peak, 10 centimeters of driving pressure on the pressure control. RV function did decrease, not surprisingly. Um, but at best peak, there was no difference. So this is an example of the best TAPSI that you can see, right? Compared to the TAPSI at um, peak recruitment. So you can see it's like 2.15 centimeters versus 1.35. So obviously as we are recruiting the lungs, we're, we're putting a lot of stress on the RV. And this was published last year in the Blue Journal. Net, the, the average peep went from about 12 centimeters to 21 centimeters. Right? The average chain peep, um, the average peep before intervention was 12, after it was 21 to 22. And there was no significant difference in RV function as estimated by TAPS or S prime. And you know, we, we often think about the CVP as reflecting half of the peep. Um, that is again, assuming that the distribution of compliance or elastins is 50-50 between the lung and chest wall, excuse me. And that's almost never exactly right. So you can see that even though we increased our peak by um, almost nine centimeters of water, our CVP went up by two to three centimeters of water. And then what Lorenzo did in Brazil actually with Marcelo Amato's group is they created a swine model of obesity. So they induce ARDS in swine and put weights on their abdomen to simulate high pleural pressures, high abdominal pressures. And what they found, so these, they put, um, they put Miller pressure volume catheters in the right side and left side, right and left hearts and put esophageal balloons to measure esophageal pressure. What they found was that, so this is the um, peep of seven versus peep of 19, best peep with recruitment the transmural right ventricular pressure, which is a measure of the afterload of the, on the right ventricle, drops dramatically with best peep, right? Whereas cardiac output and pulmonary vascular resistance change minimally. Pul pulmonary vascular resistance actually dropped significantly. Cardiac output almost didn't change and oxygen delivery went up, right? So these are pigs that are being ventilated with very high peeps, but their right heart function is actually improving. So this is a very nice validation, or at least support, of the kind of data I showed you in our first patient, that optimizing lung mechanics can actually improve right heart function. This is not new, right? We've known this since the 70s. Peter Suter, in a, in a classic New England Journal paper, 
define it. And there was a lot of controversy, and there still is, about what best beep is. And for his group, the best beep was the beep associated with best oxygen transport. That also happened to be associated with the best compliance. Right? As you will see, that it is not the best, the PEEP associated with the best arterial oxygenation because oxygenation is proportional in the absence of a shunt and a high zone one um, physiology. Oxygenation is proportional to mean airway pressure and it'll keep going up. But if you tie PEEP to oxygenation as we tend to do, we end up risking overshooting uh, ideal PEEP. Instead, if you tie PEEP to lung mechanics, to compliance, you, the chances are you'll do better. Not only is lung compliance the best and cardiac output and oxygen delivery the best, the dead space, the physiologic dead space, which is something that we know is incredibly strongly tied to outcomes in ARDS, uh, but we tend not to pay too much attention to it because it's a pain in about to measure. The dead space is uh, lowest at best PEEP. The physiologic basis underlying this is the U-shaped or the hockey stick-shaped relationship between pulmonary vascular resistance and lung volume of PEEP, right? We tend to focus on the right side of this curve. Uh, in fact, I've had this discussion with Antoine Vede Baron, um, who's a huge proponent of low PEEPs and RV dysfunction. And he, he, his almost exclusive focus is on this part of the, the relationship but particularly in obese patients and patients who are significantly hypoxemic or underpeeped, this is just as bad. You want the lungs to be as close to functional uh, residual capacity as possible because that is what is best for the lungs and best for the heart. And there's other data from the 1980s that shows that static compliance, best static compliance is associated with the lowest pulmonary vascular resistance. So the concept is not new. I think the the issue is that we tend to forget about it, or we've we've started focusing so much on what I would call almost a monotheistic focus on outcomes that we forget that outcomes are not the only type of evidence that exists, especially in an ICU environment where outcomes hasn't done anything for our uh, for most of our research because our patient population is so heterogeneous. So all of this was about where we end up uh, in our peak, right? And I'm making the argument that. An optimal PEEP is where we need to be. I'm just going to start going a little faster. But it's also important, it's very important to recruit the patient before you get to your best PEEP, rather than just turn the dial and go from 12 to 20 or you know, from A to B. Because, and this is completely, this, this graph is from Dreyfus's classic Blue Journal paper. I'm totally paraphrasing it and using it for my own purposes. You want your patients to be in the linear portion of the static pressure volume curve, right? Where they are, they don't have cyclic D recruitment and they're not getting overinflated. There's the low inflection point and the upper inflection point. What a lot of patients end up have, what we end up doing to them, especially if we don't recruit patients, is that they end up, because um, pressures go to the most compliant portions of the lung, you increase PEEP and your, the compliant parts of the lung get over distended and they go to this part of the pressure volume loop and uh, parts of the lung that are not recruited uh, stay collapsed. So you, you end up facing the worst of both worlds. And this is why I think most, most people would recommend staying away from high PEEPs because they don't, or they don't typically recruit. Um, there's a lot of, there's, there's some issues with this concept of open lung ventilation and the art trial that we can discuss if we have the time. Um, let's switch now quickly to the left heart in the last few minutes. Uh, imagine that you have a 76 year old woman with a history of dilated cardiomyopathy and EF 12% um, recovering from ARDS. She's hemodynamically stable, she's comfortable, she's on dexmedetomidine, uh, Vanderbilt being you know, the home of uh, the appropriate sedation uh, and minimizing delirium in, in the ICU. Uh, she is on, she's getting an SBT at pressure support of 10 over five, FI2 is 30% and she's breathing reasonably slowly, the rate is 28. Uh, <clears throat> the ABG looks reasonable, 7.34, 42, 88. She seems to be working a little bit to breathe. And you look up at, at her monitor and, and you see this, right? And so, uh, just to uh, make it explicit, this is her CVP, RTU line, pulse ox, 
and ECG, right? So you see that she has these big drops in her CVP with inspiration. Is this patient ready to extubate? Take a look, her gases are fine. She's slightly tachypnic, not, not horrible. Um, and she's on modest ventilator uh, vent support settings. Do you want to move forward? Do you want to go to 505, 0 over 0, or do you want to just go ahead and extubate her? I would argue that you want to think carefully before you decide to extubate. The reason is that the LV has an almost inverse relationship to positive pressure that the RV does, right? Positive pressure is an incredibly effective way of reducing afterload to a failing left ventricle, right? Offload is wall stress throughout Sicily. It's a little more difficult to quantify than preload. But if you think of wall stress as being defined by the Laplace relationship, pressure times radius divided by twice thickness, right? What you're seeing, I'm going to skip to this. And, and the point is that these, this is from Google, um, Sarnoff discovered in the 1950s that there's a family of styling curves for every heart. And one of the ways you can move styling curves to the left or right is by manipulating afterload, right? So as you increase afterload, the styling curves drops down to the right and vice versa. Therefore, a failing heart is very, very sensitive to increasing or decreasing afterload. When you have a patient like this, you're seeing these big fluctuations in her CVP. What they're telling you is that her transpulmonary pressures are substantial. Right, so if her, if she had a CVP fluctuation of about ten centimeters of water, uh, ten centimeters of 10, ten millimeters of mercury, that's approximately thirteen centimeters of water. With ten of pressure support, her transpulmonary pressures are about twenty three to twenty five centimeters of water. That's a lot of stress in her lungs. That's probably going to get worse if you extubate her, and doing that is going to make her heart have to work harder, her left heart, because you're taking a lot of positive pressure off the left side. Um, this has been also shown, you know, back in the days in the 80s. Um, we, I have, I've actually done this in our ICU myself. We have a lot of PA catheters. As you take positive pressure out, you can often see here they show the PA wedge pressures going up. I've seen the V waves rising. So you're getting more mitral regurg because your offload goes up acutely. And you exhibit this patient and they flash. Um, and one way of estimating the degree of transpulmonary pressure changes is to use the CVP. You don't need a pleural pressure. Uh, I learned this initially from Uli Schmidt, but um, who's now at UCSD. But there's actually data, again, going back to the 70s. People complain when I give talks that my data is almost always from 70s, 80s, or sometimes even before. But it's because I think we've forgotten a lot of this data or we don't utilize this. The difference in CVP is very, very correlated with the difference in esophageal pressures. So you can use the change in CVP, not the CVP per se, but you can use the change in CVP during uh, spontaneous breathing to estimate transpulmonary pressures. One way to apply it to ARDS, pure ARDS, is if your lungs are still vulnerable, if you're, if you're not clearly getting better, and you start seeing lots of CVP fluctuations as you start weaning ventilator support, you need to do something to change that. You either need to put them, um, sedate them, put them on volume control or something like that. Or if, if they are getting better and their heart is fine, you can sort of bite the bullet and move towards extubation. But this kind of swings in transpulmonary pressure are very bad for both the lungs and the left heart. You can actually give people cardiogenic pulmonary edema with these massive swings in transpulmonary pressure just by styling forces at the capillary level because your interstitial pressure becomes so low. And I've seen this more than on more than one occasion. So I'm going to skip this. I'll end with saying that, you know, ARDS has historically presented us with three challenges, oxygenation, ventilation, and lung mechanics. And we have focused on oxygenation for most of our time studying ARDS. I would argue that PEEP is not intended primarily to improve oxygenation. This is why I'm not a fan of the ARDSnet PEEP table. It is in my mind, a way to optimize lung mechanics as a happy um, side effect almost, oxygenation and ventilation both get better. Right. Mechanical ventilation is not in the ideal world. It's not a trade-off between what's good for the heart versus what's you know, um, good for the lungs. Ideally, there is a place with, which is a happy medium where both the heart and lungs are sort of optimized at the same settings. And it is critical to recruit lungs before increasing PEEP. 
the one thing I tell my fellows is that if you want to try just bumping up the beep, um, you're welcome to try it, but check your driving pressures before and after. 90% of the time, what happens is your driving pressures will either stay the same or they'll get higher. And if they get higher when you've increased PEEP directly without recruitment, what, what your patient is telling you is that you're putting more stress on their lungs. Then you need to back off or you need to recruit. Um, driving pressures and transpiratory pressures may be more useful than relying only on the plateau pressures. Uh, a couple of months back, The Lancet published this really nice paper with, with a number of you know, the world's greatest experts in ARDS, uh, including Taylor Thompson, on personalized ICU medicine for ARDS. And they talked about all sorts of molecular stuff that has never been shown to work and is probably never going to work in, in this field. We, we still don't know how to classify our patients. But I would say that you can do a form of personalized medicine with physiology, with your ventilation and hemodynamic strategies, right? So you use... Um, you use driving pressures, you use transpiratory pressures, you use point of care ultrasound to evaluate both the heart and the lungs while you're taking care of your patient. Do recruitment and best beep. In, when I'm on in the ICU, any patient who's significantly hypoxemic and comes in on some random dial a peep uh, number gets a recruitment best beep trial, certainly they're hemodynamically unstable, right? I, I, I've had pulmonologists tell me, oh, this patient is post tetralogy of fallow, has a very poor RV, they can't tolerate recruitment. 90% of the time, that's not true, and they can't tolerate it. Um, severely hypoxic patients, patients with poor compliance, patients with RV dysfunction, the best data come from these patients. A lot of that is Lorenzo's work and post-cardiac surgery uh, patients, which is, some of it is from Amato, some of it is, uh, um, was published in this paper in anesthesiology. It is not yet clear if benefits apply to everyone. The ART trial, which came out in JAMA a couple of years back, showed potential evidence of harm, but if we have time, we can discuss why. I don't think the ART trial is um, the place to hang our hat on when it comes to a lung protective ventilation. I will stop here with a algorithm for uh, ventilation in the ICU. So if your driving pressure is less than 15, P2F is okay, PCO2 is 45, then you're probably in a reasonably good place. You don't need to do anything. If that's not the case, do a hemodynamic assessment. See what, what, what your heart is doing. Use, use ultrasound, use pressures, use whatever tools you have. You know, non-invasive cardiac output measures, all of them are fine. Um, if there are no contraindications to recruitment maneuvers, so if you have a large pericardial effusion, you don't want to do this, right? Uh, do recruitment best beep you have to be in the room all the time. I, I walk around with a dilute stick of epi with 10 mics per mil uh, when I'm in the ICU because I often end up giving it. Um, you may need to support the RV during the recruitment process, right? Reassess, is it effective? Is your driving pressure better? Is your P2F better? Is your, for a given minute ventilation, if your PACO2 is coming down, your dead space is improving. If, it's, if that's the case, great. If not, is this patient a candidate for prone positioning? Do they need ECMO? This is the time, this is the, you want to do this early rather than later. And then you could consider doing more complicated things like esophageal pressure and EIT guided recruitment. Thank you very much. And if there's time, I'll, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for having me again. Um, just, I think we're pretty close to the end, yes. but there's one question in the chat about um, whether or not there's a, you, you had mentioned that there's no, that you don't think there's a descending limb on the Starling curve. And yes. the question was whether that was on the LV side, the RV side, or both. So a small ventricle is more effective uh, in some cases than a large ventricle. The descending limb of the Starling curve implies that you, you can increase cardiac output by making the, the ventricle smaller. The place where that works is when you're reducing functional regurgitation, right? So when you're reducing functional mitral regurgitation, when you're using reducing functional tricuspid regurgitation by reducing the size of the right or left ventricles. But that is not a Starling curve phenomenon because a Starling curve is a cardiomyocyte level contractility issue, right? So you can't improve contractility by reducing the size of the ventricle. You can improve forward flow, you can improve energetics, there are a whole bunch of advantages to making the ventricle smaller. Increasing the cardiac output with the exception of functional regurgitation, uh, improvement of functional regurgitation is not one of them. Thank you. And then could you just quickly describe the, the MGH protocol for recruitment and best people? 
Yeah, so always par paralyze the patient because um, it's it can be very dangerous to do this in unparalyzed patients, uh, even if they're deeply sedated. So we always paralyze our patients. We put them on pressure control ventilation, so pressure control. So my settings are typically uh, 10 centimeters driving pressure and pressure control. Uh, start with a respiratory rate of 10, which gives you a respiratory cycle time of six seconds and an I2, I2E ratio of one to one. So three seconds inspiration, three seconds expiration. Start with a peep of around 10, depending on where the patient is, and then increase your peep every two minutes. Give, give them about you know, 20 breaths at each setting and go up from on the peep only from 10 to 15 to 20 to 25 to 30 to 35. I generally stop at 30, between 30 and 35, depending on the patient. Um, one of the problems with ART was they initially recruited to up to 60 centimeters of water and they had three uh, pneumothoraces and arrests and stuff like that, which contaminated some of their data. And then once you hit that recruitment, you switch to their baseline volume control settings and you choose a PEEP somewhat at random, or I generally start around 24, 26, uh, partly dependent on how big the patient is, and keep the patient at, do a decremental PEEP trial of two centimeters less PEEP every two minutes. So you go from 24, 22, 20, 18, whatever, and measure driving pressure and compliance at every PEEP setting. And the place where your driving pressure is the lowest and your compliance is the best is your best PEEP. Oftentimes, as you go below that, your driving pressure rises again, and that tells you that you're now on, you've come off the lower inflection point of your pressure volume loop. And um, so then you re-recruit, because now you've lost recruitment. So you re-recruit, do the whole thing again, and switch straight to your volume control and your best peep. And your best peep is generally about two centimeters higher than your identified best peep, because you want to stay on the um, ascending limb of the curve. You, that's, yeah, that's sort of broadly the, it takes time. It takes about 45 minutes to do. Um, and particularly in a hemodynamically tenuous patient, it's not something to be taken lightly. So you want to be in the room. You want to be able to intervene. The nice thing about this recruitment strategy is that you can um, abort before you've hurt the patient seriously. If the patient truly cannot tolerate recruitment, you abort at a peep of 15 rather than doing a 45 centimeters of water sustained inflation for 45 seconds, which can be really tough. If there are any more questions, um, if you wouldn't mind just emailing them to me and I can pass them on to Dr. Bakshi. Thank you again so much for being here.